Welcome to Keith and I Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today I am joined by Booge Daddy Patrick Smith. What have you done with the old Patrick Smith and who the hell are you? Somebody just n gave me a nickname recently, the Boog Daddy. I don't know why. I, they saw a picture of me with an AR and I guess I'm old now, so. Well, it, we needed Boog someone Daddy. to replace Magnus Panvidya because I have not seen that man forever. I hope he's doing okay. <laughs> Today, we are discussing a paper written by two professors at New York University. It is titled, The Myth of Ownership, Taxes and Justice. What we'll be reading from is a summary that was published in 2002 toward the beginning of this excerpt. Before we get into it, uh, Patrick is the host of Disenthrall.me. Uh, Patrick, what is Disenthrall and where can people find it? Uh, Disenthrall is on all the major video platforms. Um, it is a philosophy, uh, activism, uh, debate channel where we try and get to the bottom of the, uh, philosophy of Liberty. And we try and teach people and help people to, uh, do good in the world and bring libertarian principles to the world. So that is Disenthrall. Terrific stuff. Let's get in to the article. They begin with the abstract and then go into the nine sections of the paper. Abstract says, in a capitalist economy, taxes are the most significant instrument by which the political system can put into practice a conception of economic justice. Okay, I'm sorry. I I, I knew we were going to go one paragraph <laughs> at a time. It's so bad. The first sentence is so bad. So I, I want to know what you think. In a capitalist economy, <coughs> Taxes are the most significant instrument by which the political system can put into practice a conception of economic justice. Am I just b being too overly critical or does that piss you off as much as it does me? I mean, this is why I asked you right before we started recording if you wanted to like read the paragraph, because I knew we weren't going to make it at all. Like sentence one, capitalist economy is uh, all about implementing economic justice. These, this is a completely incoherent and self-contradictory sentence using the terms that they've chosen to use um, in a capitalist economy. Everyone is in charge of their own wealth and it, it is not going to be centrally planned towards the implementation of some commie uh, democratically decided uh, conception of economic justice. So right from the gate, we're, we're off the rails. The rails never existed. The train was never on the rails. <laughs> Notice how justice is implied in the practice of taxation. So it's like capitalist economy, we're sort of this doggy dog state of nature, but we want to usher in justice. And this is sort of we as a society stepping in. Does it ever occur to them, give me your money or I'll put you in a cage is an unjust form of acquisition, uh, 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 of acquiring property? No, it never, ever occurs to them. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure that they think about the words that they're writing. I think they're just saying things that their friends are going to pat them on the back in their, in their colleges and say, Oh, good job. Good job. Excellent article. We're going to publish that. You're so smart. You're a leader. You're a thought leader in the space. And they'll be like, Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. And then they'll just go on about their stupid commie professor lives. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm confident that I'm going to make it through two sentences here, <laughs> but conventional ideas about what constitutes tax fairness found in the vigorous debates about tax policy going on in political and public policy circles in economics and law are misguided. In particular, the emphasis on distributing the tax burden relative to pre-tax income is a fundamental mistake. Taxation does not take from people what they already own. Property rights. Okay. Are the okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so so, th th that last so, sentence. Uh, the, the last <laughs> sentence was, in particular, the emphasis on distributing the tax burden relative to pre-tax income is a fundamental mistake. Taxation does not take from people what they already own. I want to carefully give be generous, and I want to say that even when I was a status Patrick, I agree that distributing tax burden relative to pre-tax income is a mistake. Even old status Patrick said, look, if we're all equal, then all of our tax bills should be the same amount. And I don't mean the same percentage. 
I mean the same dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Just because this other person managed their resources better, better and became more wealthy doesn't mean that they should somehow, I mean, like they're still a human just like me. They should be paying the same dollar amount and the pre-tax income, all this stuff, that was nonsense. And that was status, Patrick. So just trying to be generous. I agree with that much so far. The rest of this is like a looter's manifesto. Like it's like they're saying the quiet part out loud. It's like to be a looter and to not feel that you're what you're doing is evil. You have to hold these principles like what, what you what we're taking from you is actually rightfully ours. I mean, they're, they're saying the quiet part out loud. Property rights are the product of a set of laws and conventions of which the tax system forms a central part. So the fairness of taxes can't be evaluated by their impact on pre-existing entitlements. Pre-tax income has no independent moral significance. Standards of justice should be applied not to the distribution of tax burdens, but to the operation and results of the entire framework of economic institutions. The result is an entirely different understanding of a host of controversial issues, such as the estate tax, the tax treatment of marriage, flat versus progressive taxes, consumption versus income taxes, tax cuts for the wealthy, and negative income taxes for the poor. Patrick Smith, response to the abstract. Uh, it's just, uh, it's the looter's manifesto. It's, um, look, it's okay to tax whatever we decide we're going to, and I'm using the royal we here. It's okay to tax whatever we decide we're going to tax because it's not really yours to begin with. And there's no special moral significance on your money. I I mean, <laughs> okay, looter, uh, I guess come and take it is the only real, there's no rational response to this because it's just somebody looking you in the eye and saying, we do not reciprocate property rights in that way with you to which your only response can be, okay, well, I guess I have to defend myself. If you're going to come and try and steal my stuff, w what other response is there? It, there? You can't make a, you can't make a mount, a philosophical defense to a, a gun pointed at your head uh, by a thief. You just have to defend yourself. So this is the classic, very high standards for the voluntary sector, no standards for the public sector. This might be one of the best examples, because if they're saying, well, it's it's like an extension of John Rawls's argument. Well, you don't you didn't you know really work for the money. A lot of people inherited the money they have. And for the people that did, quote, work hard. They might have earned it on the back of someone else, or even if they happen to be really ambitious, you didn't earn that ambition. You were born with ambitious genes. So we could just take that and say, well, you, Mr. Government, you didn't earn this $4 trillion a year, you tax and revenue. You just happened to get elected in a state that happened to vote for you more than they voted for the other person, assuming the votes were counted legitimately. You just happen to have the ability to tax. You just happen to belong to a group that people uh, happen to obey at this point in time and might not in the future. So all of these like accidental arbitrary things that they apply to the market, of course, apply to government. So it's like they kind of apply to the freedom voluntary sector, but they apply tenfold to the state because everything they say, well, that assumes they own things legitimately. Does the state own the Pentagon legitimately and the Capitol and the hundreds of thousands of acres of land that they uh, claim the right to exclude other people from? When it comes to what justifies ownership, how would you explain that people are justified in both owning their own bodies and property they acquire through homesteading or voluntary exchange? Just so we could have a fundamental understanding before we go on. The greatest, most universal, most simplistic, most... Uh most consistent property ethic that I have yet to date seen is what I call the Neo Lockean property rules. If you get to something first and you make first use of it, it is yours in perpetuity. Any additional rules you add to that, such as pre-tax income is not a moral consideration <laughs> necessarily adds more rivalrousness into the property system, which makes it a worse property system. And so beginning with your body, you got there first. It's yours. You made first use of it. 
it's kind of the most obvious one, right? You can't, you can't be alienated from your body, even if you wanted to yet, at least. And so, uh, you, you have the first use property right in your body and then everything else that you get to and use, or you, uh, you know, nonviolently trade for or work to create in the world. Uh, by virtue of that simple, straightforward rule becomes yours as well. And anybody else coming along after the fact and saying, no, 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 that's mine. The only way that that dispute can be resolved is for them to show higher claim to that piece of property. So if you, if you acquired and amassed a little bit of wealth and these assholes come along and write an article declaring that you don't own your property, if they were going to adhere to the property rules that the rest of us really do and reciprocate between each other, they would have to show higher claim to it. The government would have to show higher claim to your property than you in, in some kind of arbitration scenario. Can they do that? Of course not. Because imagine just for a moment, what that would look like. The government would have to come up with maybe a contract that you signed where you agreed to an arrangement between them to say, I agree to give them X amount of money every year or whatever, and we'll call it taxation. That would be what it would look like. Have anybody, has anyone ever signed such a thing? Absolutely not. Of course not. They cannot prove higher claim to your property. And of course not. It is absolutely not. It, it absolutely is a moral issue. So that would be my response to that. And, and, and that's the classic scam that voluntary contracts are actually exploitative, but involuntary contracts mm. are the result of justice and us achieving a democratic society. It's that is one of the most Orwellian things that mm -hmm. an actual reflection of your values doesn't represent you, but the democratic will as a result of majority election. Well, we're your representative, so we can therefore coerce you. That supersedes your voluntary action in representing you. That is just one of the most bizarre ones. And they don't even have the initial claim that like any normal, like an HOA, an HOA, you yeah. signed the contract, you read it, you signed it. So you're bound to the rules you agreed to. There's no such thing with these people. They just declare by fiat that they have the right to do these things. All right. So you want me to read the introduction? Here we go. Taxation arouses strong passions fueled not only by conflicts of economic self-interest, but by conflicting ideas of justice or fairness. Though empirical questions and questions of economic theory are inescapable in responsible discussion of tax policy, so too are philosophical questions of social and economic justice. But the topic has been neglected by philosophers, especially by comparison with such legal issues as abortion and freedom of expression. This book aims to make a start at filling this gap. Economic self-interest. Um you know, Nancy Pelosi is actually just like a volunteer who works out of a monastery and is a nun and doesn't collect any money. Uh, Chuck Schumer, Adam Kinzinger, uh, Joe Biden, they don't get any benefits. All, all they do is sacrifice. How on earth was the scam pulled off that people in the voluntary sector are self-interested, but the people coercing you are actually the servants, the literal public servants the internal revenue service what an unbelievable uh dichotomy that they have created here respond to that and anything in this paragraph please i i mean they just they really believe that there's power and just authority in the the democratic um majority uh and and in the same way that like you might get together with five of your neighbors and be like hey we've got this other neighbor that's in trouble we want to pool some money to try and help them out and the five people come together and agree and chip in money and then they help people. They think that that same validity and morality of that kind of voluntary assistance um, can be done involuntarily just through this magical voting process. Uh, and that's really all it stems from is that they really believe in this um, uh, non-consensual just authority of, of the majority. It's, uh, it's gross. And, and it's in large part to the public school system having taught people this since birth. So I don't even blame the people personally for it. It's just what everyone's taught. Yeah. When it comes to um, self-interest, uh, do you have any uh, important uh, ideas on self-interest in the market versus self-interest when it comes to the state sector of anything? Is there anything people generally miss about the concept of people engaging in their self-interest? What do you mean? 
Yeah. Um, so uh, when I say, um, well, people are self-interested, therefore we need a state is one of the great things that I hear. First of all, state actors are self-interested. Second of all, if people are self-interested, certainly the only system we would want is a free market where you can't pursue your self-interest unless you first please the consumers or the employees or get someone to donate to you or do something. So their claim that human beings are self-interested or some are, that should inevitably lead to, well, make sure there's not a state where these self-interested people can occupy and therefore exploit the rest of us. When it comes to justice or economics, is there uh, anything else on the claim that, well, people are self-interested, therefore we need a state to protect us? Well, they they juxtapose economic self-interest, in this case, with justice and fairness. And... Um... I mean, their idea of justice and their idea of fairness might actually be conflicted with uh, economic self-interest because it's such a terrible conception of those things. But I think what they're trying to communicate to people is that economic self-interest is also the enemy of, of helping people, which is, as you know, because you're helping with uh, Voluntary Virtue, uh, the nonprofit organization that we set up to show people how it's actually done without government and without coercion. We put, we, we get a group of people together, we collect donations from people willing and wanting to do good in the free market. Like this is, this is economic self-interest, this is personal self-interest, and this is personal virtue. That's why we named it Voluntary Virtue. People want to help others. When they're in trouble, people want to do good and help them. And they want to come together and uh, and protect their communities of people. That that's that demand for that service is why the government is able to sell it to so many people because so many people want there to be a social safety net. It's just that the government does it terribly because it involves coercion and no accountability. When you don't have coercion, when I can't point guns at people and say, "Give me your money so I can help others," then suddenly I'm accountable not only to the donors, but to the people I'm helping. And if I start doing a terrible job or wasting the money or whatever, I'm held to account and people stop donating. Unlike the government, which can just extract more resources the next day with their guns again. Um, so it's, it's important for us to do the, to do things like voluntary virtue, where we show that, look, not only are people willing and able to help each other absent government, but, when we do it, it's better, more efficient, and um, and and we're able to help people more. And where can people uh, learn more about Voluntary Virtue? Voluntaryvirtue.org. And you know what? The we're, we're having the weirdest issue right now, and it's finding people that need help. So if you know somebody, and we, we have an interesting way that we um, ask people to let us know that they need help. We don't want people coming to us directly. We want somebody advocating on your behalf to approach us and say, hey, I have a friend that's in need and can you work with us on on um, getting him some help in, in XYZ area? So if you know someone that is in need, please contact us, voluntaryvirtue.org, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Moving on, section two, traditional criteria of tax equity. Traditional analysis of tax justice demand that the distribution of tax burdens satisfy criteria of vertical and horizontal equity-like cases should be treated alike and relevantly different cases should be treated differently. Various criteria for relevant differences have been proposed, drawing on ideas such as ability to pay and taxation in proportion to benefit. All these analyses suffer from the fundamental flaw of treating pre-tax income as a morally significant baseline. This Ugh, it's so <laughs> it's so burdensome to to treat people as if they own things. Ugh. It's it, it really is a burden. I mean, just having to ask people if they want to hang out versus me being able to kidnap them and take them to my house. It takes so long. I mean, you have to wait till they're alone. You have to approach them. I have to put on my personality. Ugh. Uh, we need to stop this arbitrary uh, kidnapping rule that's been foisted uh, upon the rest of us. This mistake can partly be traced to a prevailing everyday libertarianism 
according mm-hmm. to which our legal property rights simply protect what we are independently morally entitled to. This view is incoherent. Patrick Smith, let's try to keep I mean, this show under three hours. What uh, is oh, it? Mean, it's every well, first of all, it's an admission that the default baseline of people is that they want to own their property and they want to be free and free of coercion. Yes. And that admission is important because I think that's where we as libertarians work from when we're talking to people. It's like everybody everybody has this built in. Um, and he's just calling it in, incoherent, which is not an argument, but, um, uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, without belaboring the point, this is just a, this is a looter's manifesto, man. He's just going to declare that your property rights don't exist. I love number the point. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I love the point about everyday libertarianism that people's default is that anything you get, you more or less own unless you get it through like theft or something like that. I, I, I mean, of course, the average person in their everyday life wouldn't go into the homesteading principle or even or e- even I think they would. Like when you're on, I think Jeffrey Tucker used the idea of both a camping trip and when you're tailgating at a game that everyone who has never read John Locke or anything, they go by the homesteading principle. It's like, well, why does that guy get so much space? Well, he's cooking the hot dogs. Well, he's setting up the tents. Well, they're using that space, so they get it first. I get less, but granted, I didn't go through all this effort. So even people who have never read Rothbard, Hoppe, Larkin Rose, or any of our heroes, it's almost like they automatically go to this thing. And even there's a lot of evidence that David Friedman points to that animals such as birds or gorillas still engage in the private property ethic and homesteading principle. So what they're doing is they're essentially taking something that exists in society, something that exists everywhere, and they're pinning it uniquely on the voluntary sector. They mention ability to pay uh, things that are morally significant. The mistake can partly be traced to a prevailing everyday libertarianism, assuming our property rights are uh, independently, are what we are independently morally entitled to. This view is incoherent. If we just take the idea of inequality of attention, some people are more popular than others, we would still use this libertarian ethic. A lot uh, more people listen to Adele than listen to me, so I got to persuade them voluntarily. (laughs) And a lot more people listen to Ben Shapiro or Joe Rogan than myself. As far as I can check, I haven't checked my numbers lately, but let's assume that that's true. Uh, So even these drastic inequalities, people assume I can do whatever I want and any, you know, unequal result is morally justified so long as no one's kidnapping me or forcing me to listen to one thing over another. So I think almost they they strengthen our position to a uh, to a great extent. Is there anything else you have on um, everyday libertarianism or assuming people own what they already get? I just want to, I mean, I'll, I'll just reiterate like the, to use your analogy of a camping trip, we go to a camping area and you show up and somebody's already pitched a tent and is camping in the location you wanted. You, no one would walk up and just start pulling up the stakes around the ground and lifting up the tent and just throwing it out and pitching their tent. And when questioned by the person that got there first, they wouldn't say, Oh, uh, getting here first has no independent moral significance. That's just not, I mean, to say that is just to reveal yourself as the aggressor in the situation. That's all this is. They're just saying the quiet part out loud. As opposed to the $4 trillion the government takes every year. That is independently morally justifiable. Everything else should be suspect. And and we really need to look into uh, into the rest of this. I think I swear there was was one more thing here in proportion. uh, Okay. So he had mentioned ability to pay uh, pre-tax income. I don't think all pre-tax income is morally justified or is uh, is something you're entitled to. For um, example, you could have a number of thieves, a number of human traffickers. You could have people working for the Pentagon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Raytheon. These I would consider these people co-conspirators to mass murder in Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq. So those are perfect examples of 
uh, pre-tax income that I think is totally unjustifiable because they are involved with initiating violence against peaceful people. So it's almost like we can sort of take this premise and say, yeah, you're kind of right, sure. But it would also include you professors who are writing this manifesto on why theft is so uh, virtuous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, nowhere in here, nowhere in here do they reference the conflict of interest that they're being paid from the funds that they're defending the stealing of. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit of a thing that might want to be mentioned. Too predictable. <laughs> Section three. Yeah. Read it off. Economic, economic justice in political theory. Once we abandon the idea that justice in taxation is a matter of determining a fair share of tax burdens... We must ask what the legitimate ends of government are and what the legitimate means of pursuing those ends are, particularly insofar as they involve the taxing power. Is the legitimate role of government limited to the provision of public goods or does it include providing benefits for worse off people and promoting equality of opportunity or welfare? Consequentialist and deontological theories of social justice provide importantly different approaches to these and other questions that stand behind tax policy, such as the moral standing of the market, the importance of individual responsibility, and the proper understanding of the moral value of liberty. So um, we need to give, uh, we're very pro-choice. Uh, women need a choice in uh, only one matter in their entire life. Everything mm. else, they should be coerced. The, uh, the the state should take precedent. I I mean, come on. This is just uh, so in your face. They're saying, you know, the, there really are questions of liberty as they put no restraints on the state. They say, well, so long as they're helping people and equalizing their welfare and the opportunity of the masses, well, that's the role of government. What happened to all these vitally important constraints that you were just talking about? When it comes to... On uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go. No, go ahead. Uh, when it, I was just going to ask, when it comes to equality of opportunity or the legitimate role of helping those who are impoverished, forget that we're talking to mostly libertarians. What do you say when you're talking to someone, a well-meaning person who has this mindset, and they say, Patrick, dude, I, I like this idea of voluntary exchange. I'm terrified of the poor not getting the help that they need. Why should I consider your ideology? So the, the, the proof is in the pudding. The reason why the government welfare state is so large and so many people defend it and want it to exist is because so many people really want the, the unfortunate, the disadvantaged, the injured and the sick to be taken care of when these tragedies happen. That de market demand exists and it is vast and strong and real. And if you stop pointing guns at people, that demand doesn't just disappear. Everyone will go back to what they used to do, which is where they form community groups and, and partnerships where they help each other directly without pointing guns at people. It's, on, it, it's only through this um, mass superstition, as Larkin would put it, that people find that it's morally acceptable to point guns at people to get what they want and to make their neighbors help them help people. When in reality, their neighbors want to help people too, just like they do. They don't need to point guns at them. You're just uh, doing it because, I don't know, it's always been done that way since you were born. We're, we're in this weird time now where people have, all the people that exist uh, have been born after these guns were pointed at people. And we accept the reality that we're presented with when we enter the world. And so this feels normal, but it's not. This is not how it has always worked. And it definitely doesn't have to work this way. Of course. And if you want uh, the worse off to have the most amount of opportunities, they mentioned equality of opportunities, make sure there's not a big regulatory state putting tons of hurdles between people's idea and their dream. Just as needing a license to vote stops people from voting, needing tons of licenses and a four-year degree plus medical school, that puts more hurdles in the way of people achieving their dreams. That is the biggest detriment to welfare that exists, not to mention the central bank. Anyone who saves, their savings are constantly being depleted because the state monopolizes the currency and continues to print more money. Never, It's not even by an act of Congress. It's not even a referendum. They don't even pretend. It's literally just the Federal Reserve. 
doing uh, d doing these things on our behalf when it comes to equality of opportunity. So so you could say, well, we, we want to help the poor, but what about uh, I just want to give people the opportunity. Whatever happens afterwards, screw it. Equality of opportunity is why we need at least some state to provide some school. I get that we all want to help the poor, but we need some schooling to be coercively funded just so there's like a basic fundamental access point that everyone has. What do you say to that? I don't get to point guns at you, whoever's saying that to me, to, to get what I want. And I don't have the authority to ask someone else to point guns at you to make things how I want or to get your resources for whatever thing I think is important. I don't have that authority. That person doesn't have that authority. We can't give that authority to somebody else because that authority doesn't exist. And it doesn't matter how many people you get together that don't have the authority. Those people can't add together and magically create the authority to do it. No number of people can override that basic morality of I don't get to control you against your consent doesn't matter how many people I have. Um, and I just wanted to point out that even with Voluntary Virtue, our, our 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, most of our expenses have been government regulation related. So even trying to do it on our own privately, not as a government agency, most of our expenses right now have been making the government point their guns elsewhere. Because if we tried to do it without their approval and their paperwork and their regulation, guns would be pointed at us like at every step of the way. So th the authors here think they're so clever and saying, well, we're questioning these fundamental assumptions and you guys have assumptions that you haven't questioned. You're assuming that you own your pre-tax income. Hmm. Well, uh, d do they assume, uh, uh, or does it ever occur to them? Why is this word tax only applicable to the state? If I am quote helping people, Shouldn't I have the right to issue taxes? If the state can issue taxes because it's giving education that we all benefit from, can't the Libertarian Institute and Voluntary Virtue issue taxes? <laughs> so long as they, you know, spend it on, say, a book, maybe they could title it the Voluntarist Handbook, a collection of essays, excerpts, and quotes. And then shout out to the out number to one book. anarchist book on Amazon right now. Well it done. Is. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Dude, that's educating people. And by the way, I'm actually not charging if you want the free PDF. It, there were no PDFs when I went to Arizona State. You had to always buy the textbook, and it was like 80 to $120. That's what they mean by free education. Very expensive education. That's what they mean by free. So mm. um, so why is it? That, I mean, this thing called taxation, it's just it, it ranges from morally neutral to actually a good thing, yet only one group can do it. I mean, if I hmm. said, imagine, imagine if libertarian said voluntary trade is really good. By the way, only white men should be allowed to do it. Okay. Well, <laughs> you'd see the scam immediately. <laughs> you'd see the scam up right on its face. Well, if it's so good, shouldn't women and non-whites and people in Japan and, and if it's so good, why are only you allowed to do this thing? Well, certainly if taxation and conscription and regulation, especially if they're so good, why is only one group allowed to do these things? So the professors that think I think you, so I think you have a great point. I, I'm calling a, a voluntary virtue board meeting right now, and we're going to take a quick vote to uh, go ahead and tax some people. Like, I think I've been looking at this all wrong. <laughs> well, you know, Dick Cheney, if we taxed him at 100 percent, it would not be a nap violation. Uh, the estate of Donald Rumsfeld, uh, that would be the greatest virtue I think we could access. <laughs> and even if it wasn't him, like, you know, the pre-tax income has no important moral significance. So why don't we tax these uh, professors? I think that's really the, the moral of the story here. Yes. So long as we remind them that they don't really own it. Um, it's not, right, a, it's so not an important moral consideration. So. My Whatever. turn. Correct. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Number four, uh, or section four redistribution and public provision. Taxation has two primary functions. First, it determines how much of a society's resources will come under the control of the government for expenditure in accordance with some collective decision procedure and how much will be left in the discretionary control of private individuals as their <laughs> personal property. 
call this public private division. Mm. Jesus Christ. I thought I could get through this whole thing, mm. but I, I just, uh, okay. But it, uh, taxation has two primary functions. All right. First of all, saying that something has a function doesn't justify it. Um, uh, I'm a human trafficker for two reasons. I need money and uh, we send the girls on great yachts, which they love and have a good time on. Okay. T having uh, t two functions doesn't justify anything. Uh, coming under c control of, I got to give them credit. At least he didn't say control of the people. Uh, I will give credit where credit's due. When it comes to the first That's half true. of section four, what do you have to say? <laughs> I, I I was going to criticize the, I mean, yeah, you're right about control of government instead of being vague with control of the people. Um, but I, I like how in both situations, he never talked about ownership. He just talked about control. So no, there's no real property ownership involved here. It's just a matter of who controls what and at what time, you know, first of all, we're just going to decide how much what percentage of your uh, belongings of your wealth is under control of the government and what is still under your, you know, what, what we allow you discretionary control over. It's like, how filthy is that? Like, just, we're not even going to mention ownership here. We're just going to talk about, you know, who, who gets a say in your stuff that you work to earn. Yeah, there's something so magic about the scarce resource of money that people don't apply anywhere else. Like when it's um, we as a collective are going to decide how you spend your scarce time. It, I feel like people would resist that a little or uh, we're going to decide uh, the scarce resource of who your friends can be, who you're allowed to spend time around. We're going to take 30 percent of your furniture or 30 percent of your customers are going to be siphoned off every month and given to another company just to make things equal for the greater good of society. It seems like money gets people in such a mindset that doesn't allow them to think clearly. It's like, I, I think the, the best example Jason Brennan gives in markets without limits, he goes, so it's okay if I choose to give someone a kidney and, you know, save their life. Sure. Oh yes. Everyone says, okay. But if I want to be compensated, all of a sudden I'm a kidney seller, I'm an or organ trafficker, it's inherently evil, or the case of minimum wage, you could have an internship for zero dollars an hour. But if you charge two, three, or four dollars an hour, well, that's less than the minimum wage. And the money system requires that we have X amount uh, for a X amount of hours. I mean, there's something about introducing money into the status mindset that makes them go absolutely bonkers. Do you have any theory as to why this is or why people with such great achievements, they're, they're both PhDs, by the way, why they can have just no thought put into anything? The only thing I can think of is just that that's how it's always been. And that's how everyone that's ever been an authority in their life has told them it has to be. That's the only reason, because if any, every time I talk to somebody and we slow down just enough to talk through how this actually works, they can see it clear as day. And another way of talking about this is like, if we could rephrase this, the first half of this paragraph, and it could, it could be like mini, ba uh, let's call it mini kid, which will be my 1984 name for the Bureau of Child Management. Okay. So mini kid has two primary functions. First, it determines how many months of women's wombs they get to have control over. Now, you know, sometimes some months out of a woman's life, their womb will come under the control of government for use in accordance with many kids collective, you know, decision procedures about how many, you know, we got to maintain population according to the, you know, collective decision procedure and the rest of it, you know, will be left in the discretionary control of the private women, you know, womb owners, I guess we should say to be politically correct now, but, uh, you know, as their personal property, call this the public private division. Anyone would see how insane what I just said is when we, when we shifted away from money. Of course. Yeah. G great. Uh, g great points. Let's get back to section four second regarding taxation. It plays a central role in determining how the social product is shared out among different individuals, both in the form of private property and in the form of pub publicly provided benefits. Call this distribution. Though these functions are typically run together in political discussion, 
by the use of slogans such as big government, they are conceptually and normatively distinct. It is difficult, however, to address the two policy issues separately since the two functions are mutually interdependent in practice. Patrick, do you see a difference between, first, how much money comes under control of the government, and second, how much is shared out among different individuals? Uh, again, they just use this language. They call, they call it social product. How the social product is shared. That doesn't exist. There's people doing things and acquiring property, and that property is stolen and redistributed and and anything else is euphemistic language uh which is rampant throughout here um do i see a difference between how money is stolen and how money is then dis redistributed i mean yeah those concepts are two technically different things um but you know the fruit of a poison tree like if you're going to steal something it doesn't really matter what your plans are on how to hand it out afterwards you're stealing stuff stop it um and to and to renounce property to say that you know it's just not a moral consideration again is just uh, this is just the, the the looters manifesto. I'm I'm really not seeing a difference in these two. One determines how much will con come control uh come under the control of the government. Second, how it's shared. Well, the state taxing something doesn't necessarily follow that it's therefore being shared among a group of individuals it's not like the money is taken by the state and then evenly distributed among the population it's given to some at the expense of others so the idea that you're just calling it shared since when has sharing involved threatening to cage people i wish these professors would share their income with uh, with people like us i don't see a difference uh between these two at all I, I think it's just, uh, I think all they're doing here is saying, well, we have two uh, groups that we need to please, both the expert class who cares about control under the government, who listens to the experts, and then the democracy class who cares about the masses and the downtrodden, allegedly, and cares about popular consent or even populism. Uh, so it just looks like they're trying to appeal to two different groups here. I see no principal difference. I'm open to being wrong about that one, certainly. So please let us know in the comments below. Anything else on that? If not, get into section five, the tax base. Number five, the tax base. The choice of tax base income, consumption, wealth, is an instrumental one. It depends upon the efficiency and justice of the outcomes different tax bases promote. This goes to the point you just made. Uh, traditional fairness-based arguments for the consumption base, for example, that it is fairer to savers or appropriately taxes according to what is taken out rather than put into the, quote, common pool. <sighs> all suffer from the everyday libertarian mistake of treating the pre-tax distribution as morally significant. Uh, so annoying. But there are important philosophical questions to be asked about the value of wealth and the legitimacy of taxing endowment, potential rather than actual income. So my whole thing is simply the everyday libertarian argument of treating pre-tax income as morally significant first of all, doesn't address any income that's the result of initiating aggression or fraud. So those would be excluded. But the fact that it is reflective of people's voluntary decision-making practices is the ultimate way that people should live in society, where they treat people as, a, as an end in and of themselves, rather than a mere means, you know, just exploiting them in such a way that would not respect their consent. Treating someone as a means, you know, we do this with whoever I bought this pen from. I didn't learn everything about their life. I treated them more as a means and they didn't, they weren't in love with me. They just wanted my money. That's okay. What we're talking about is a mere means where you could rape, murder, or steal. That would be excluded. So that is my general justification for why it would be morally justified to treat, um, pre-tax income as uh, the everyday libertarian justification for something uh, for, for something like that when it comes to the tax base what do you say i'm gonna 
I'm going to start a new libertarian podcast called The Libertarian Mistake. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. No, but so the libertarian mistake is, like you said, consent, respecting people's consent and respecting people's property. And this person calls that a mistake. This person has chosen not to reciprocate those property rights with the rest of us. And all that tells me is that I don't have to respect this person's property rights anymore. Uh, they are a looter. They are a danger to, to me, my family, and my resources, and everything I've worked for. And if anything, this little article makes them my enemy. I mean, they're, they're coming after my stuff by trying to delegitimize my rightful claim of ownership over it. That is absolutely unacceptable and not up for negotiation. I do not negotiate over my rights like that. So let's talk about the implications of this idea that you just assume you own things because of, you know, libertarians having so much power within society. (laughs) Dear (laughs) Jesus, do I wish. (laughs) I mean, the the progressives control Hollywood, the media, Mm. they have the House, they have the Senate, the Democrats have the White House, they have HR departments, they have K through 12 education, they have universities, and they're like, the problem is everyday libertarianism. Yeah. I mean, my God, they get compulsory education. It's hard enough for us to get voluntary education, and these people get it compulsorily. So, uh, when it comes to. uh, Which is a white pill. Because, in spite of every institution being owned and controlled by them, and even getting all of our kids up until they're 18 to 25 years old, the libertarian through line is still there underneath it all, enough that this guy is complaining about it. (laughs) That's Excellent. great. If yes. That is, thank you for pointing that out because I need things like that to watch. <laughs> yeah, me too. So when it comes <laughs> to the, the implications of this idea, let's say we take this idea, what would be negative implications? I mean, my first thing is you assume you own yourself and you don't belong to the collective. So what, you just get to pick whatever you do on your own time selfishly? What about what we as a society need? We need you to do agricultural work. We need you to plant seeds and make food, and we need you to make houses for the homeless. Therefore, we get to uh, decide as a society that it's necessary for your labor to be allocated in such a way. So this is an argument for obviously slavery, let alone uh, forced birth, as Elon Musk has made the point that um, you know there's actually a depopulation uh, issue that uh, we're facing. What are the major implications of this idea that they should have to face? uh, This is a return to the state of nature. Uh, Just to reference uh, my anti-subjectivist manifesto once again, rights are mutual reciprocal understandings between people. This guy is not reciprocating the most basic of them, which is a respect for one's body and property. And the only thing you can do to that, this guy's dragging us back down into the state of nature, the land of the beasts and the lions that take what they want because, well, they don't find any moral significance in the, in the fawn's life. (laughs) That's the state of nature. This guy's going to take what he can, what he has the power to take, and he's going to justify it with a bunch of flowery words in this article. That's all it is. Um, I love, go ahead. No, that's it. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I love how you use the word reciprocal because so many people think of uh, libertarianism being Robinson Crusoe doing his own thing on the island by himself. But if he's on the island by himself, he can't violate the non-aggression principle. It's like, well, no initiating violence against the sand and the water and the trees and the coconuts. That wouldn't apply. It only applies once the second person comes onto the island. Therefore, It's not just something that we say happens in society. It necessarily means something that could only apply in a society, meaning two or more people. So it's not this, uh, the term individualism sucks. It's just really unfortunate. But what we're really getting at is what Sheldon Richmond calls social cooperation over social coercion. There is no people doing things all by themselves as the cartoonists love to make us out to be. So I I love that definition. Give me that definition one more time. Rights are mutual reciprocal understandings between what I, well, one way to say it is between sentient beings. That's the simple way of saying it. 
uh, sentient is a little bit rough philosophically, but their rights are mutual reciprocal understandings. And look, this has made me unpopular in a lot of circles because a lot of people are, you know, natural law adherents believe that rights exist in nature and they can be derived from existence in a, in an objective, um, deterministic way. And what I'm trying to tell people and clarify with my definition of rights as mutual understandings between people is that they're way more fallible than people think they are. Rights are these whimsical, paper thin, almost just these, these magical things that you're lucky to have with your best friends. And they are so paper thin that all it takes for you to lose them is for somebody to decide to stop reciprocating that agreement with you like this asshole. He doesn't reciprocate. So if you say, well, I have rights, I have property rights to this guy. He'll be like, I see nothing. I don't agree. I don't see your rights. And there's, there's not any physical tangible right in nature that you could raise up in front of you to defend yourself against this guy when he comes for your money. It's just a concept and he doesn't agree. That's how frail these concept, this, this reciprocation of rights is. All it takes is for an asshole like this to disagree that you have property rights and suddenly your safety and security in your own property evaporates, at least between you and this guy. Excellent points. Section six, progressivity. Considerations of fairness have no direct bearing on the issue of a progressivity in tax rates. There is no genuine issue of vertical equality. Whatever a proportional progressive or a regressive tax rate scheme is to be preferred on ethical grounds depends upon the justice of the outcomes the different schemes tend to promote. It is clear that this instrumental question requires a good deal of empirical information for its answer. While it is often claimed that high marginal tax rates generally deter work, which is bad according to most theories of justice, this is not the consensus among economists. That has to be a lie. I, uh, I mean... <laughs> I, 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 I forgot to uh, go into the paper and find the citation. He, what they're doing is um, the sleight of hand of saying that work equals work. So whether it's work that I do to trade on the market with other people who value it, or it's what I consider to be work, which could be reading fiction novels and reviewing them for people that don't enjoy what I review, they would still call that work saying that that person's not deterred. Being a book reviewer is a good thing. And that's what that person's doing. They're not accepting the legitimacy of value being something subjective that only exists if someone else appreciates that value and trades their time or money in exchange for it. So that is, uh, I just know that that's a lie. I'm sorry. I don't know. I haven't been to the moon. I don't know if the earth is flat, but I can tell you from everything that I've <laughs> ever learned that I don't need to spend too much time looking into it. Well, what do you have on uh, section six progressivity? They're, they're just declaring their philosophical moral foundation as consequentialism, which, you know, has its, whole host of problems and, and, uh, self-contradictions. Um, th that's what I took from this. It's like, you know, and it's not even like what they consider to be what provides the most utils or what provides the best outcome. It's what the collective thinks will what the collective predicts will provide the best outcome. And it's not even that it's what the collective votes on what the collective thinks will provide the best outcome. It's like so many steps removed from any agency over the outcomes that it's absurd. Uh, that that's what I got from it. Yes. And people who think that work involves, you know, volunteering for AOC or Bernie Sanders or even Donald Trump. I don't value that at all. Uh, I'm not sure how many other people would value voluntarily giving to those organizations. If there wasn't a state, they could then occupy and violently impose themselves on the rest of us. So they're using the term work to mean both things that people would appreciate voluntarily and things that are coerced upon them. I, I think Bob Murphy gives the great example of, well, GDP increased during these years in, you know, between 30, uh, 1933 and 45. And he made the point that notice they don't differentiate between a person buying a radio. One of the most important things you could get at the time, just this mind blowing device 
and that same amount of money going to a tank that was then given to the State Department, which was used in the war. That's measured exactly the same. So when they measure these things in an identical way, of course you're going to end up playing this util game of, well, technically it actually doesn't show. Of course it doesn't show when you're using this ridiculous method of uh, d determining who gets what and why. And, and, and there's just one more thing. Oh, the, the instrumental question. So, very common, both people on the left, like Stephen Grumbine, very nice gentleman who's been on the show, and Curtis Yarvin, also a gentleman who's been on the show, have referred to the state as an instrument. What do you say to someone who says the state is like a pen or like a gun? This is an instrument that could be used for good or evil. What do you say? It's all euphemistic language. The state doesn't exist. The government doesn't exist. It's a group of people working under a label, doing things, acting in the world. Now, can those people work for good? Well, not if they're paid through stolen money. Like it's it's uh, it's premised on theft. So it's fruit of a poison tree. It it from from step one. Um. Well, I mean, can can a thief steal some money and go do some good with it? I mean, the thing that he does with it could be good. Could be, but he stole stimulate it. Stimulate the economy. <laughs> yeah, stimulate. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm hypersensitive to language these days, man. And so when I see euphemisms all over the place, I try and deconstruct it immediately. And that's that's the first thing. I don't even so, know if I answered your question. I apologize. So can we differentiate between something instrumentally neutral and something that is conceptually bad? So if I say... Um, I have a number of slaves or I stole a certain percentage of money. Is is that a conceptual category that we could say, before I know any other details, I'm putting you in this unjustifiable category. Whereas if I say I have a gun, well, do you use it to rob people? Do you use it for self-defense? So the instruments are something that are neutral. When we're talking about government, we're literally talking about some people having the right to rule over others. So it necessarily is bad. It's never neutral. It's not the gun. That, that's why, it, you know, as much as I like Yarvin and Grumbine, I think they're just wrong to call this something morally neutral, much as if I say, well, I'm an abusive spouse, but you have to find out what my goals are with the abuse. You know, some people face abuse and are stronger because of it. And that's really my goal. So you have to look into these things. Can't we just say some things are inherently bad and not instrumental? I, this is the first I've heard of this concept, so maybe I need to go and watch the episodes where you've talked with them about this stuff. But the government is not an instrument. It's a group of people working together um, in various ways. It's a group of individual people acting in various ways towards a common goal or under a common label. That's not an instrument. Like, there are people acting. At, what was the other one? Instrument and... So, instrument, something neutral, and conceptually bad slavery, theft, kidnapping, oh, I see. Um, mm. assault, murder, uh, things that uh, I can put in the bad category without ever really saying, well, what are the effects of those things? Um, because if we call them something neutral, then we're just like granting a, like this blank check to do, yeah, it's all right if some people rule over others, just send us the util measurements after you do mm. such a thing. I would never accept that under any other circumstance. I mean, to me, and again, maybe I need, I need to go and, and listen to what these guys' points are, but to, to me, people are not instruments and and the, the the moral judgments are placed on interactions between people. So if the people in government are interacting with other people coercively, I would put that in the category of bad. I would put those interactions in the category of bad. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the instrument um, thing is, but I, I, got, I probably need to listen to what they have to say on it. Give us uh, section seven, please. Inheritance. Setting aside spurious considerations about double taxation and fairness to donors, the real moral question concerning taxation and inheritance is whether gratuitous transfers... <laughs> gratuitous. <laughs> Gr <laughs> the real moral question concerning taxation and inheritance is whether gratuitous transfers require special tax treatment on the ground of equality of opportunity. Some place such a high value on personal responsibility that confiscation of all such transfers has ethical appeal. A more appealing view, 
a, a more appealing view to this guy holds that opportunities need not be strictly equal so long as they are adequate for all. On such a view, there is no ground for the confiscation of gratuitous transfers, but neither is there ground for the current exemption of such transfers from the tax base of donies. <laughs> Doni. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, I would love so, to get this. I wish he had shown up on this show. I would have. I mean, wow. I really wish, but they decided that uh, they uh, embraced their everyday libertarianism. They said they own themselves and they chose <gasps> not to come on. I interviewed both of them. Uh, Thomas Nagel and Thomas Farage. The, the names are at the top of uh, of this paper. Um, they, they're actually both lawyers. So you I offered say, to inter you offered to interview them. Is that what you said? Both both of them. Yeah, and yeah. and they both and they both sent me back emails saying, "I own myself. I'm choosing not to." All right, they didn't say the first part, but they said the second part, which implies the first. It's so, that libertarian mistake of self ownership. Yeah, you know? stupid libertarians. God, I hate these guys. Um, so. I will say they have rejected the equality of opportunity. It's just such a high cost. It, it's impossible. Anyone born that I know siblings that are born to the same parents and they're totally different. They don't have the same opportunities. They're treated differently because they look differently because they act differently. So notice that they have sort of abandoned this idea, which I think goes back to a guy named Richard Eli. I just did a show with Danny Duchamp on this. Uh, he was actually a progressive who said that progressivism is give him a chance, the equality of opportunity. So let's say I just want to give people an adequate chance, not equality, just an adequate chance. Why should I be a libertarian or a voluntarist? I, I, on an individual level, I don't disagree. I think it'd be awesome to, to try and um, give everyone uh, a chance. Like if I'm looking to hire somebody, I want to open those doors up as wide as possible. And I want everybody, no matter what their background or you know, socioeconomic strata is, I want to see if they've got what it takes, if they have what I need to hire. Um, it's when you institutionalize it and try and force it down the barrel, so to speak, <laughs> that, uh, that it gets all screwed up and, and it, um, and it really skews the entire scale uh, and it, and it removes power from people with means to help people to actually accomplish the goal that it's talking about. Like if, uh, if a business is taxed 40% of its income or whatever, uh, that's less income that it has to go out and find people that it can, um, that it can assist in these ways. I thought that it was a great point by Milton Friedman saying, are you familiar with the concept of people working hard so their children can have a better life? And that's their motivation to which most people say, of course, this is like every parent I know that works really hard for their kids. So therefore uh, to say that, well, we're not deterring anything if it's after they're dead. No, you're really deterring, um, you know, innovation progress or anything else that would be inside of this argument when it comes to what will be inherited and therefore you're not really entitled to something. Well, if we're not entitled to something that my mom and dad worked so I could have, how is the government entitled to any of the laws that were made before they were ever elected? Joe Biden didn't, you know, he didn't write the Civil Rights Act. He didn't write the tax code. He didn't write the Constitution. Actually, he's so old, he might have been there during the Constitution. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, Joe Biden didn't declare independence against the British. So why is he able to reap all these benefits? Again, these things that kind of apply in like any society that would exist. In other words, you didn't earn, you didn't work for all that which uh, you are benefiting from. Yeah, it kind of applies to America, Mexico, China, Zimbabwe, but it applies 10 times over to the state. They didn't work for any of it. They said, we'll cage you if you don't give us this cash. So, I mean, this is just such a flat, unbelievable, blatant contradiction in this entire theory. And it's also worth pointing out. The, yeah. This article began by saying your pre-tax income was not morally significant, and it has now said that your post-tax income is not morally significant either. It's almost like they don't respect your property. 
It's like the tax thing is not even really important. It's just like your income is not morally significant. That's what he's saying. Your property, not morally significant. Section eight, tax discrimination. Okay, the title pisses me off. Okay, first of all, (laughs) is it discriminatory when only one group in society can issue taxes? That feels like discrimination. Okay, section eight. Since the distribution of tax burdens has no intrinsic moral significance, there is no... Genuine- Not much has moral significance to this guy. I just want to point... You know what he has in common with every thug in history? They don't have a lot of moral significance going on. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it's like, this doesn't have more any moral significance. That doesn't have any moral significance. I do what I want. You know why? Because I have guns. A- end of paper. He should have the- just said, I have guns. Give me things. That That's his entire paper. This child was unplanned. Therefore, the parents didn't earn the child. Kidnapping, let it go. I mean, please. Uh, th- <laughs> just, just everything. Section 8, tax discrimination. Since the distribution of tax burdens has no intrinsic moral significance, there was no genuine value of horizontal equity. Favorable tax treatment of owner-occupied housing is not intrinsically unfair, though it may be objectionable for contributing to social inequality and a marriage penalty is not unfair, though it may be arbitrary. However, (laughs) the tax system, (laughs) however, the tax system can have discriminatory effects. For example, a combination of joint filing and graduated results graduated rates results in a disincentive for second earners at present mostly women to seek work response to section eight uh i'm i'm really struggling to come up with coherent responses to just i feel like we've answered it all i mean it's just the continuation of our earlier criticisms it's just threats. This is this is a guy that has that, that is advocating the power and command and control of everyone around him. Like, okay, this is just more of the same. I I can grant him a marriage penalty. Like someone joining choosing to join this contract is unfair. Okay, it sounds like an incel, but we'll, we'll let, let's I mean, move away from that. Uh, l- let's say it's unfair. Yeah, um, there shouldn't be any coercive collection of property so picking on those who get married uh those who get married or those who have kids i get that it's arbitrary but you don't have the justification to tax in the first place you're assuming the intrinsic moral significance of taxation and the intrinsic moral significance of government and a state Mm. I, i i just i'm struck by the hubris of people that think and talk like this like i'm just picturing like i'm sitting out of my driveway and my in my neighborhood. And I'm just like talking and musing to myself about how I'm going to take my neighbor's property and use it. And like my, my neighbors are walking up the sidewalk and they overhear me just like, you know, I'm going to take Bob's, uh, you know, I don't know, lawnmower and use it over here for this poor person. And he's like, what do you mean you're going to take my lawnmower? I'm like, no, no, no moral significance. No, no moral significance. (laughs) It's a hubris. (laughs) Just to sit there and muse about how you're going to confiscate and utilize everyone else's stuff. Ah, this is a bad guy, man. See, (laughs) it's it's not, you're not entitled to things that you get voluntarily. However, they are entitled to things that everyone else has. I, I mean, of course, there's their theory of entitlement. I think one of the biggest things is they say, well, you guys have a theory of, um, ownership. You believe people own things. However, to own is simply to exclude use. So anytime, anytime someone takes a sip of water, they're excluding me. When the democratic socialist says, I want more funding for health care, they're talking about exclusionary ownership over money or items that would be allocated toward the health care center, whether it's concrete to build a hospital, whether it's, you know, I don't know, plastic or steel to make the hospital beds. That is ownership. And if we go in, or the January 6th thing, they're, again, very upset at, 
That is them saying this scarce resource called the capital, you are not allowed in here to do A, B, and C. Only we are allowed in here. So again, they're pinning this saying, you guys think you own things and you can exclude people. Well, that's just this everyday libertarian myth you have. <laughs> no, it's something you also have. We just yeah. disagree on the th theory of justification. We apply it consistently. He applies it arbitrarily. That that's that's a big difference. All right, and, uh, number and, nine. And, and Go ahead. I'm sorry. But one more thing. However, yeah. the tax system can have discriminatory effects. Um, for example, a combination of joint filing and graduated rates results in a disincentive for second earners. Uh, a few paragraphs ago, I was told that money and work had no disincentive as to whether or not people perform labor. I guess things oh. have changed in in three paragraphs. Um, Busted. You got him. That's a good one. Yeah. And also, of, <laughs> uh, of course, he's pinning it on uh, on mostly women, as though men don't do, uh, I, I mean, outside of the housework, as if men don't do entrepreneurial investment, that they get paid zero dollars an hour for. I mean, what, mm. what a ridiculous game and so unnecessarily uh, d divisive. But it's just classic social justice nonsense for them to uh, divide the sexes while they're already dividing the races and dividing oh, yeah, we gotta, people based on income and everything else that's arbitrary. Yeah, we've got to throw out all these libertarian preconceived notions about who and how much we can tax for the women. That I mean, it's always some to help somebody. Give us chapter nine. Conclusion, politics. <laughs> what politically <laughs> what politically feasible results might be drawn from the foregoing reflections? Self-interest does set limits to what is politically feasible because of all those <laughs> libertarians. But most people defend their views about taxation in moral language. So much would be gained from the wholesale rejection of the morally obtuse but tenacious ideas of everyday libertarianism. Increasingly widespread understanding of how capitalism... Ha what? Hold on. Increasingly widespread understanding of how capitalism works may help. We may hope that most people are coming to believe that even under capitalism, the organization of the economy and the allocation of its product between public and private control is a legitimate object of continual collective choice. And that this choice must be made on grounds that justify it not only economically, but morally and by a democratic procedure that legitimizes it. Oh my God. Oh, I'm going to summarize this entire thing with one line. Moral significance for we, but not for thee. That, that will be perfect. my summary. That's perfect. You see, because what we really need is an understanding of, uh, you know, voluntary arrangements and original appropriation. But uh, democratic procedures, that's just totally legitimate inherently. Everyone deserves a quality of opportunity or at least uh, adequate opportunity determined by the, uh, the, the ruling class. Uh, when it comes to an understanding of how capitalism works, I think I just my biggest thing was making that uh, point earlier that it uh, is strictly reliant on uh, you not being able to receive access to scarce resources, money, value, unless you first create it through employment, investment, transfer of income. Uh, when it comes to understanding how capitalism works, any uh, go-tos that you have, any you know red pill moments that you would give to someone who uh, actually doesn't understand, like these two authors, don't understand uh, how capitalism operates or what it is, it's a definitional difference. What this guy calls capitalism is not what capitalists consider capitalism to be. Capitalism is free trade, self-ownership, property rights, the lack of coercion, the lack of guns being pointed at you to control you and to take your property and use it for things, whether or not you consent to it being done. Uh, and I almost think it's like a Hegelian dialectic thing where they're trying to call what exists now capitalism. 
so that they can say that capitalism is bad and we need to push it more socialist. It's like it already is socialist. That is already the situation that we exist in where guys like this think they have the uh, right to come and take your stuff because it's not morally significant. Um, capitalism is the opposite of everything he's talking about here. Capitalism is you own the effects of your actions. You own the, the, uh, the fruits of your labor. Uh, you are sovereign in control of it. And, uh, and no one can override your consent over your stuff. I mean, that is, that is capitalism. That is the opposite of this. Um, so, so I, notice that his, uh, it, his opposition to this almost, we may hope that most people are coming to believe that even under capitalism. So he's about to contrast it with even under capitalism, the organization of the economy and the allocation of its products between public and private. So notice yeah. he just separated two things that are totally harmonious. So for example, um, does Amazon, Walmart, Sears, air conditioning companies, and Apple computers, are they, uh, do they benefit the public or the private? <laughs> Obviously they benefit the public, uh, because it gives people access to things they previously didn't have access to. What is, uh, if we really had to get into the mindset, is he saying, uh, things that everyone has access to versus things only some people have access to? Is that what you, if we had to steel man his position, is that what he's saying? It's going back to allocation of control. Does the, the public at large control the property or do the private owners control the property and which one is legitimate and what that balance should be? Like, again, it's, it's classing the Overton window. It's like fixing the Overton window away from private unilateral control, even being on the spectrum. It is, it's only a question of the spectrum between, you know, more collective control or less collective control. Uh, ignoring, you know, the scary communist word and, uh, and the scary, you know, private control, uh, fully private ownership or whatever. Um, I, 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 the, every time I come on your show, I quote something, um, generally from Ayn Rand and I have one for this. Uh, it's much shorter than last time. May I? Let her rip. This is from uh, Anthem. Uh, the word we... The word we is as lime poured over men, which sets and hardens to stone and crushes all beneath it. And that which is white and that which is black are lost equally in the gray of it. It is the word by which the depraved steal the virtue of the good and by which the weak steal the might of the strong, by which the fools steal the wisdom of the sages. I love that. It is like the, the ultimate rebuttal to the looter's language, which depends on collectivizing everyone and collectivizing everyone's property and everyone's consent and everyone becomes this we instead of the individuals that we are. So if we had to really differentiate this public versus private, uh, the only thing I can differentiate is that which is under state control and that which is not under state control. However, there's no conceptual difference because if you say that uh, the military is public, I have tried to influence the military. They <laughs> respond to me as much as, let's see, Epson printers, uh, CenturyLink modems, the Sure MV7 microphone people, Amazon, Apple, anyone else. I don't have control over this organization. Actually, I have more control over private organizations because at least I can disassociate with them. That's much more control than I've ever had over John McCain. I remember Diane Feinstein got, I think, uh, like a thousand calls uh, regarding the troubled asset relief package TARP in 2008, saying, we don't want to bail out Wall Street. She has a very left wing constituency. They said, screw these banks, like 97 percent said, no, vote against TARP. And she voted for TARP. So what he's calling public, he's assuming everyone's involved. No, very few people are involved. Well, everyone benefits. Some people benefit at the expense of others. Uh, so, so this fake difference, the only difference is public means we get to violently take your money. That is the only significant difference I've put 
years of thought into this. That is the only meaningful difference that I can think of when it comes to either Section 9 or anything within the myth of ownership by these two very kind, virtuous professors. Uh, do you have any final thoughts, Patrick? It's moral significance for we, but not for thee. The, this guy is not somebody that I would ever reciprocate rights with. He's a, a thug and a looter and deserves no respect. Professor of Law Liam Murphy and Professor of Law Thomas Nagel. Gentlemen, oh, I, invi uh, I, I invited you both on. You're still welcome on the Libertarian Institute anytime you'd like to correct. I'm, uh, I mean, Booge Daddy, Patrick. That guy has no Boog. idea what he's talking Boog, about. Boog, not Booge. Booge sounds like bourgeoisie. It's not Booge. I'm <laughs> Boog. Boog. Like Boogaloo. So <laughs> but we don't Boog say that Daddy. word. He obviously it's doesn't just, know what he's talking about. So you guys need to come on. Out. <laughs> All I did, I put, look at this fake thing. This is a book of mostly other people's work. I don't know what I'm talking about. Please come enlighten us. Serve the public. And come on to my show and tell us what it really means to understand the difference between public and private and morally significant income and immorally insignificant income. <laughs> Patrick, and I've got to yeah. change my name in this thing because I forgot, <laughs> I didn't even notice that was there until we had already started. <laughs> Patrick Smith, any final plugs? Yes. What's up? Uh, Disenthrall.me if you want to see more of my content. Uh, Philosophy and Activism is on Disenthrall. Uh, if you want to see a bunch of uh, anarchists and voluntarists and freedom-loving people get interviewed, go to Anarchast. Uh, if you want to help people in need, go to Voluntary Virtue. Thank you for watching. Dot org. Don't tread on anyone and the Libertarian Institute.